This morning, uh, I'm going to take, uh, take us through some scriptures which will deal with baptism. I want us just to look at baptism, what it means, and so forth. We're going to look at what baptism is. We're going to look at what baptism isn't. We're going to look at who baptism is for. And finally, we want to look at the significance of what baptism is actually all about. After the message, we're going to go straight into communion uh, so, so as not to disrupt the flow. If you don't have uh, a little, a, a little uh, communion cup, just put your hand up. We've got some, uh, uh, some deacons here who will bring you a little communion cup. There you go. Wonderful. Our passage of Scripture this morning is one which our baptismal... Again, I keep calling them candidates, they're not anymore. Our, our, well, they were baptismal candidates when they were going through the, the course. And uh, in their handbooks, they went through and they looked predominantly at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to read that this morning. If you have your Bibles with you uh, or your devices, uh, you can please turn there this morning. And let's read together. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died is set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let me pray and commit our way to the Lord this morning. Father, thank you as we come to your word. Father, as we, as we read these words that uh, the Apostle Paul has written to the Roman church, it gives us a, a, a good understanding, Father, of, of just what happens when we're baptized. It tells us the consequences of Christ's death but also the benefits of his life when we enter into relationship with him. So, Father, open the ears of our understanding, the eyes of our spirit to see, to hear, and, Lord, help us to be a courageous people that we might put into practice that which we hear this morning from your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for some of you here this morning, and I met a few of you coming in, uh, the setting might seem just a little bit strange. Being in a Christian service with prayers and singing. I mean, Aussie blokes, we don't normally come out and sing, do we? Not unless it's the footy final or something of that nature. So it might all seem just a little bit confusing. And... Because some of you have been brought up to think that baptism is, is simply a priest sprinkling water on a little baby's head. Let me just preface my comment this morning by affirming that there is not one mention in God's word about an infant. And by infant, I mean just a little 
a little itty bitty baby being baptized. Baptism can only come subsequent to believing. That's why we call it a believer's baptism. We heard the testimonies this morning of those young folk who had been living their life the way they wanted to live their life, ruling and reigning in their own universe until they came to Christ, until they believed the claims that he had upon their life. And having believed, were born again. And that's what we've celebrated this morning. And so we call it a believer's baptism. The reason for this is simple. It's exactly how the Bible portrays it. You see, what this is, this baptism, is simply an outward demonstration. They're putting on a little play for us. An outward demonstration of an inward transformation. Listen to Jesus' own words from Matthew 28, verse 19. These were some of his last words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again in, in the book of Acts, written by Luke, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, who also believed. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Do you see there the sequence of believe first, then baptism was to follow. And of course, there are many, many other scriptures uh, that uh, clearly show that belief must precede baptism. And that makes sense as we look at what baptism actually represents. Let's first look, though, at what baptism isn't. What baptism is not is some kind of a good luck charm like a rabbit's foot that you may carry in your back pocket to ward off ill fate. You got a rabbit's foot. I've had many parents inquire, ring up on the church phone, hello pastor, I was just wondering if we could get our children done. <laughs> get them dipped. Get them sprinkled. As if this act might somehow imbue them with some divine moral inclination. <laughs> Not likely. Neither does it put them in any right standing with God. It gets their head wet. That's all. The act of baptism upon an unbeliever is of absolutely no benefit because baptism itself does not impart to anyone any saving benefit. The only benefit it does bring is the blessing that does come from obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his word. Believe and be baptized. It's not that hard, is it? You had one job to do. What baptism is? Baptism is a public declaration of a per person's confession in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a confession of belief in his finished work on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for sin, allowing the believer to come back into fellowship, to be saved from the eternal punishment of sin. And again, we've heard this morning those testimonies. I think one illustration I have found 
helpful in kind of explaining a little of the significance of baptism is that of the wedding ring. I've had the joy of marrying a number of folk and uh, the poor old nervous groom, he always feels very, very comforted when we get to the ring portion because that's nearly the end. There's a sense of relief. There's often a few words said about the nature of a ring, uh, about uh, the implications of its form being round and endless. And then, of course, we hear those three words, with this ring, I the wed. But do you know that slipping a ring on someone's finger never got anyone married? There is no power or efficacy in consecrating a marriage. It's simply a symbol, a demonstration of a heartfelt commitment. And that, friends, is in essence what baptism was, is for us and was for this morning for those believers who were baptized. And that's why it's imperative to be a born-again believer before being baptized. It is our spiritual union with Christ which enables us to benefit from his substitutionary death on the cross of Calvary on our behalf. And it's that union which is demonstrated here in this ordinance to be baptized. Let's look again at that passage in Romans, this time in verse 3. And we've got some little uh, graphics that, uh, that will come up in a minute that will help us just to understand. These graphics were in the book that the, uh, the baptismal candidates went through. Uh, and it just helps so much in understanding the sequence. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, you might think the language of, of baptism may seem odd or harsh. If you're not particularly uh, acquainted with church culture or Christian language, it seems a strange thing. But the difference between an unsaved person and a person who has placed their faith in Jesus is said to be the difference between life and death, between light and darkness, between blindness and being able to see. That's the stark difference. But again, these are simply analogies of the natural realm, from the natural realm, to describe what's happening in the spiritual realm. When a person repents or turns from their life of self-serving and sin, and I so appreciated so much of that from these testimonies this morning. And when they accept God's free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, they are considered to have died to their old sinful self. That first graphic shows a person who's turned their back on worldliness and a life of sin and is entering into the water to be baptized. Come now to verse 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This second graphic, again, it illustrates for us very clearly. Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. We came down from, from this side into this death. We were buried. 
there is, there, there is two important points here about a burial. The first is that it's final. There's no going back. Those that went through the waters this morning, consider your, reckon yourself. It's an accounting term. You add up two and two, it makes four. When you add up the sin that you are living and what Christ has done for you, it equals your salvation. Reckon it. You are dead to that old life. We were buried with him, therefore, by baptism into death. This is important. Secondly, it strengthens the identification and union with Christ, who also died and was buried three days before he was resurrected. But of course, we know that death could not hold claim to Jesus. It was in the song we sang. He had lived a, a perfect and sinless life and he was raised on the third day. Represented here in this third picture and from Romans 6, 5 we read, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be uh, united with him in a resurrection like his. And also in verses 8 and 9, Now if we have died with Christ... We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Our fourth and our final pick shows this now baptized believer. And this is an important one. Because our baptised folk this morning have now got a whole life ahead of them to live. And they need to be and are empowered by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit and of the resurrected Christ. And so as they walk into the newness of life, they walk in the power that is theirs through Christ. Power to say no to sin. Power to say no to the voices of the world. Because be sure, the devil doesn't like anyone being born again or baptized. And he will try to claw them back with lies, subterfuge. The devil came only to kill and to steal. And to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Romans 6 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I remember someone telling me as a young Christian many years ago, God's good in that he doesn't just give us a new start in an old life. He gives us a whole new life to start. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us this, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. So I hope this morning as you've been able to witness these baptisms which are a public confession of each of these believers' faith in Christ that you might gain insight into why baptism itself holds such a deep significance in salvation for the believer. It may be this morning that you're a believer but perhaps you haven't yet been baptised. Good luck. There's no expiry date. No best before date. If you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no reason why you cannot be baptised and we would love to catch up with you and talk about that at some stage. Or perhaps 
you're here this morning to witness these baptisms because of a friend or a, a relative. And you've never yet put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to chat through that also, please come and see myself, Finn, any of the pastoral team, or someone that you know is saved, talk to them. But of course, the topic of Christ's death on our behalf is the very central point of the Christian message, and it's important that we keep it there. Our life depends upon Christ's death. And that's why today we're going to be taking communion together. This is our second ordinance of the morning. The Lord says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me.